All right, welcome to the, uh, let me see here, March 4th, <laughs> I don't remember what day it is, um, meeting. For Beta Alpha Psi, today we have uh, Jessica Simmons here to talk with us. Uh, but before we get started, I just have a few like an little announcements. Um, we thought we might end up having Vita tonight. Uh, however, that has kind of been put on hold. Uh, we still haven't received the logins we need to get into the tax software. So we're hoping by next week we can get that from the United Way. Um, but please be watching your email for any updates, um, any forms you may need to fill out. Uh, for some of you who have volunteered previously, we're gonna need an alternative email, uh, which we'll ask for in a form that will be sent out via the BAP uh, email list. So be watching your email for updates on VITA. Um, we are gonna be doing an additional community service uh, project again. So in the fall, we did around Thanksgiving time uh, letters to the nursing home. We're actually gonna be doing that again this time, uh, right before Easter. So if you could, um, it's the, basically the same thing. Uh, include a picture of yourself, make sure to space it about one and a half, uh, spacing, bigger font, that way it's easier for them to read. Uh, we'll be sending out an email with some of these details in it, uh, but we're gonna need those letters by April 1st so that they can go through the quarantine process uh, for the residents to get them by Easter, which is April 5th. So um, email them to me when you write them, include the picture in the email so I can print them off and then I'll deliver them to the nursing home uh, like before. And that is gonna be our April, March-ish, April-ish um, community service project. Uh, and also another reminder, um, the regional meetings, uh, some of the registration lines are still open. So there's a regional meeting on March 19th. If you're interested in this, please let uh, Maida Thompson Abbott or myself know, and we will get you registered for that. Um, I'm sure there's lots of interesting sessions that they're doing. So if you want to know more information, uh, you could probably Google it, um, the BAP.org website, and it may tell you a little bit more about that specific meeting, uh, or you could ask uh, Maida Thompson Abbott about it since she's been registering people. She probably knows a little bit more about the individual meeting. Um, and additionally, last but not least, officer positions are still open. We have a reporter, a director of professional development, and I think a couple others that are still open. So if you're interested, um, but you're not really sure like what one you want to do, email me and we can definitely set up a virtual chat and go through the different ones that we have available, kind of some of the time constraints or whatnot, the responsibilities of the officer positions to see if there's one available that you would feel comfortable with or that you would like to try. Um, and if there's any general questions about that or anything else, as always, feel free to email me. Uh, we can set up a chat, like I said, or email back and forth, have a phone call, whatever your preference would be. Um, so I'm always open for questions, but uh, that's all the announcements that I have for this week. So without further ado, uh, Jessica, the floor is yours. Great. Um, I'll put a plug in for Director of Professional Development. That's what I used to be for Beta Alpha Psi. It was a great career point. So I, I put a plug in that everyone should look at that. Um, but today, thank you guys for having me. Um, I figured I'd go through, just give you a little bit of background about me, about Cherry Beckert. And then Cassie Casey, Casey had reached out to me back in 2019 and asked if I would give a presentation to you guys um, in 2020. Well, we all know what happened in 2020, so that didn't happen. So the things that um, her and I talked about we're going through and discussing other career options outside of audit and tax. So I thought I would talk about those items. And then uh, we had talked a lot about, about tips and tricks and things that I learned uh, my first year, first few years of working and what I wish I would have known when I was in college. So I'll go through some of those also. And if anybody has any questions along the way, please stop me at any point. I'd rather make it a little bit more interactive than me just talking. 
So um, you'll see Amanda Abbott there. Uh, this is a picture back in 2010 when I graduated uh, mm -hmm. with Beta Alpha Psi. So it's been a while, needless to say, it's been about 11 years. Um, so I graduated 11 years ago and I started working with Gibbons and Kawash, which I believe is now Brown and Edwards in their assurance department. I left about three and a half years later, um, and I looked at a firm called Novogratic out in Seattle, Washington, and I looked at another firm called Cherry Beckert in Raleigh, North Carolina. Well, Cherry Beckert sold me on Cherry Beckert and why I should come work for them. So I moved to Raleigh, North Carolina in 2013, and then a year ago, I made partner for Cherry Beckert. Um, and so along the way, needless to say, I've had some lessons learned, some mistakes, et cetera. And so I thought I would give you guys some information, hopefully to help you guys not make the same mistakes that I have. And so Cherry Beckert, um, four years ago, we changed our CEO. So we elected the first woman leader in our firm. And so Michelle Thompson is her name. She loves change and innovation. And as you guys are probably seeing, innovation is very key to success of any company, especially accountants. And we're not very creative, so we definitely need help and guidance along the way. And so with her coming in, she's changed the way that we do business, um, our efficiencies. Um, we've also hired um, a director of innovation and so through that director of innovation um, in 2019, before COVID, uh, we had created a bot and it filed a hundred tax returns for us. So just a little bit, um, something that we've been working on. Next is a little bit more about us. We're a top 25 accounting firm. We have over 1200 employees. We're a Baker Tilly at a associate affiliate. And so what does that mean? So I currently have clients that sit in London, that sit in Belgium and Germany. And so um, in 2019, I went over to visit them. Um, haven't since then, but we have affiliates over there that will go in and do the auditing procedures for us um, because of language barriers, uh, statutory requirements for those countries, things like that. And so we use our affiliate firm, Baker Tilly, for those. Um, and they also use us, since we're in the Southeast and they're not, uh, to meet with their clients and do similar arrangements. So we have our region broke out into four different sections. Um, we have Washington, Virginia, Georgia West, Carolinas, and Florida. And then within those, we have our bigger areas. And then within, say, for example, Raleigh, we have three other locations that are built into Raleigh. And those are like Durham, Fayetteville, and Asheville that roll up into our Raleigh region. And so about five years ago, we started a lot of acquisitions. So we acquired a cybersecurity firm out of Rhode Island. We acquired a software company out of Richmond, Virginia. We acquired two accounting firms in Austin, Texas, and then one in Nashville. So um, definitely been changing, merging, um, and doing a lot of innovation over the last four years. Something else Michelle has started rolling out in the last two years is our industry concentrations. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard about this. Um, so accounting firms 10 years ago used to go by market um, because by market meant that those individuals would go sit out at the client site and do auditing procedures there. You'd sit out there and you never go to the actual office that you worked in. Well, four years ago, we went to a virtual auditing model, thank goodness, before COVID, so that made the transition a little bit easier, where we'd only go out to a client one to two days throughout the year. And so that's allowed us to transition into this industry concentration focus. So that means that I work on, I personally work on healthcare and life science companies and then manufacturing clients. And so I work on those across the US and internationally. 
not just companies in Raleigh. And so that's allowed us to have more of a niche into those areas and helps our um, seniors and managers understand the business and be able to help companies understand where there's efficiencies that they can gain, costs, benefits, et cetera. Um, and so with our practice, usually a senior will determine their niches or the industries that they like. And then as they start to transition into manager, they start working only on those. So um, our Connect conference, I wish we would have had this um, back in the day, but uh, Cherry Becker does a Connect conference for 100 college students every summer in Disney uh, for about a week. And so you go to Disney, you meet all of our associates, you learn about Cherry Becker, and you get to have fun in Disney. Um, so we do that. So you need to have you need to be hitting your 150 hours um, two years before that to apply. If that's something you guys are interested in, please reach out to me afterwards. Some other opportunities we have is our internship program and our full-time staff positions. I'm sure you guys have heard that from the other firms. So the things that Casey really wanted me to go through is what I'm going to spend the rest of my time on. So when Casey had come down looking to go to NC State, she had asked me about career opportunities because she was unsure if she wanted to be an auditor, she wanted to go to tax. My first question to her was, well, do you want to go into advisory? And she was like, well, what's advisory and what do they do? So I wanna break down each one of these. So assurance is an auditor. I'm an audit partner, love it, um, but there's other opportunities out there. Um, for tax, you have your regular tax services for your individuals and your corporation, but you also have specialty tax. And specialty tax are the tax professionals that only work on international work or that only works on um, credit and incentives, um, like R&D credits, et cetera. And then you have your SALT practice and they only work on uh, state and local tax uh, issues, like Wayfair, et cetera. And then you get into your advisory practice. And your, our advisory practice in most firms' advisory practices as they're continuing to grow, ours is made up of cybersecurity group um, so those are going in there, uh, doing penetration testing, looking at your cybersecurity controls, um, and giving you SOC reports. The other, another group is called our transaction advisory group. So they're going in during mergers and acquisitions um, and helping those entities close their books, get sold, get a good purchase price. Our next group is our risk advisory group. Um, so they audit internal controls, such as like for SOX filers for public companies, which is where I spend majority of my time on public companies, not SOX. But, and then um, they also go in and help with technical accounting issues. The third interesting item that I wish I would have known earlier is our digital practice. And our digital practice, our data analytics uh, group, there's also the system implementation group that help um, with any software implementations. And they also help companies look at different technologies to make sure that they're working together at the most efficient process. And then the fifth is our wealth management group um, who help um, with VIP plans, et cetera. So when I was talking to Casey, she was asking me, well, how do you get into advisory? Well, the first place that I would suggest to get into advisory is you would do two to three years in audit. So you have that good foundation. And then from there, you can learn about advisory and then transfer over. That's what most of our individuals do. So they have that good foundation. The same thing for tax. If you're looking into specialty tax, you wanna make sure that you're spending two to three years on your foundation compliance work, and then you're transferring over with that knowledge. A couple other services I always forget is our valuation practice. Um, some of those are CPAs and then some of them are not. 
um, but they go in and value companies. Um, so if an individual is going through a divorce or they're looking to sell or another company has acquired another entity, they go in and value that company. They can value the stock um, so that they ensure that you're getting the right purchase price. And then it's our forensic service group, um, which is very interesting because they walk around our office with their guns. Um, but our forensic group, they go in, they're hired by companies or the federal or state government to look into certain individuals or certain corporations to see if there's anything fraudulent there. And then they'll go through and it can take up to six months to do this analysis and they'll come out with a report to show what was stolen, how much was stolen, how it was um, done. And then that's brought to the company or the, the state or local government um, to press charges. And the next thing I wanted to talk about is some things I wish I had known when I was in college. So I took my exam when I was um, a first year staff person. I think no one should do that unless you absolutely have to. That was absolutely miserable. So please pass your exam before you start work. Um, it's very hard to be a staff person and then at the end of the day, go home and study or study all the weekends. Um, another thing is when you're getting ready to set for the CPA exam, give yourself about four weeks of time before you wanna start setting um, and getting the materials and things like that to do your paperwork. The paperwork takes a long time. You have to go get a professor to sign off. You have to get a CPA to sign at your paperwork. You have to get all your transcripts sent over. It's just a long process. So make sure you put enough time in place for that. Also, don't put your, push yourself too hard in college, enjoy it. But also make sure you're getting good grades, but enjoy it because that time is gone and you'll miss it. Um, and then the next thing is Marshall does a, an incredible job with getting you ready for your CPA exam. Um, when I went to study, I had really good background to understand the concepts that Becker was teaching me to be able to pass the exam, which is not the case with all colleges. Um, so do, definitely pay attention because it is there to help you with um, passing your CPA exam, but you'll learn 90% of your job on the job. Um, and so my best suggestion for that is to take notes. Um, so my first year I would take notes. So if a senior would tell me how to audit cash, I'd pull up one note, I would document how at every step they told me how to test cash. And then I go to the next job and instead of asking that person how to test cash, I just pull up my list of items that they told me how to test it and then I test it and then I get to ask more questions about like, why am I testing cash, how does this affect AR, how is this affecting cash disbursements, how does this affect the company in general, and so that allowed me to quickly gain that understanding of why I'm doing the audit and what's the importance of it. It also made uh, my seniors and managers think I was smarter than I was, um, which I definitely was not. So just a tip and trick. Um, another thing to know is um, make sure you're yourself instead of thinking of what a professional should be. Um, just be yourself, have your own personality. People wanna get to know you, your clients want to get to know you, who you are. They want you to have a life. They wanna to talk to you about their vacations. They want you to talk to them about your vacations and your family and your dogs and your life. And so make sure you're just being you. Um, enjoy your career, it's not a sprint. I wish someone would have told me that. Um, I definitely have sprinted through a good portion of it. And looking back, I wish I would have coasted a little bit more and enjoyed some time. Um, the next thing is, is creating your internal and external network. It is just as important as being an accountant is. So your internal network. So if I have an issue with evaluation, I need to make sure I have a good um, internal contact that will help me with my evaluation or my tax issue, et cetera. So you wanna make those friends when you start um, coming into a firm. And then your external network, that's your beta alpha side people that you're right here with meeting and greeting every week. So make sure you keep up with contacts with them because they make great network. And then continue to grow your network. Um, 
accountants are not really good at selling, but it is part of our business. And I did not know that when I was coming out of college, I thought I would just go do some numbers, go home, call it a day. Um, but at this point in time, I probably spend 50% of my time going out and selling. And so how I've grown my network to be able to sell is I went to networking events and I meet, met and greeted with people that I enjoyed hanging out with. And so from there, they've become my friends. And that's kind of how I created my friend group down here and also my network group. Um, and so like on the weekends, I hang out with them. And then throughout the week, I do business with them. So it's just creating that network of people that you enjoy hanging out with. You never want to do business with someone you wouldn't want to hang out with. So I'll open it up now for any questions you guys might have or if there's anything else you guys wanted me to cover. Can you maybe speak to um, the differences in working for like a smaller firm versus a large regional firm? Because you've certainly had experience doing both and, you know, there's certainly uh, reasons why you would want to work for both and reasons that maybe you wouldn't. So if you could share some of that, I think that would be great. Yeah, so I started my career out with a local firm. Um, they gave me amazing foundation experience. Because a local firm, um, you're going to go in and do some bookkeeping, um, you're going to do some auditing, you're going to do some tax work. So it gives you an amazing foundation. A large regional firm has more resources. And what do I mean by resources? It means I no longer uh, do tax returns, I no longer do SOC work, and I can specialize into my niche. So I can gain a, a larger understanding of the companies and the industries I'm working in. So I can actually help them. Um, because throughout my career, I did, I'll tell you from day one, I didn't wanna be a partner. I planned on year two, I was getting out of public accounting and I was going to be a controller. Well, year three, I was just like, well, this isn't too bad. I learned a new skill. I was like, I'll keep doing this. Um, and so throughout my career, I continue to learn things like leadership, um, creating a team, um, implementing new changes into a, a large firm, um, and then it's the niche. And so what kind of keeps me here is my niche, right? Like with my clients, and so I just had one before we hopped on here, but he had questions on what are other companies in his industry doing and how are they accounting for things? And what's their operations looking like? And so I'm able to discuss that with him and help him make decisions and like help him gain an understanding of what's going on in his industry. And so to me, that's me giving back and helping someone. And so I always needed that feeling that I was helping someone and that's how I'm achieving it. And so I wouldn't have gotten that with a smaller local firm because you would work on multiple industries. And there's nothing wrong with a local firm. I love my local firm, but it just wasn't a good fit for me. I have a question about the CPA exam. Yeah. If, you, if you're graduating in May and you're going to start working in August, do you think that that's enough time to finish all the sections during the summer? No. But you probably can get three of them done if you start studying like right after, your C, right after your finals, if you start studying then. Um, and even if you can study before you set for your finals, uh, that would make it even better. But usually when individuals start in August, they end up taking an, one more part, like a couple weeks after they start or a month after they start. And which a month after you start is fine, but you don't wanna be six months in and studying that's where it's not so much fun. How are you able to make partners so quick? Cause that's what a 10 year span? Yeah, it was. Um, 
Well, I didn't coast any. And I, I, looking back, I wish I'd have coasted a little bit, needless to say. Um, but no, it was always evolving and adapting, um, I think is what really helped me do that in 10 years. Um, so everything that I would learn, I would always be like, okay, what's the next thing? What do I need to learn? And then taking those, like the skills of learning how to work with people, learning how to lead, and then kind of just jumping out there, um, out into the island by yourself and being like, I'm going to make this work. I don't understand and what I'll what I'm supposed to do, but I'm going to figure it out and like use, you know, your your brain, your analytics, your your thought process and just hope for the best kind of. And then some of it's luck. I'm not going to, to lie. I mean, some of it's luck being in the right place at the right time and being able to have the right mentor also is very helpful. Um, I will suggest as you guys are going out, if you go to corporate or public accounting, wherever you go, is making sure you find that right mentor. Um, they'll give you, each firm or each corporation will give you a mentor, but find your own. Find that person that you connect well with and um, yeah, that you have a good relationship with, and there will be a better mentor than the one that someone might assign to you. And they'll help you along the way because they'll understand where you want to be and what you want to accomplish. On your way to partner, did you move around to different locations and like change specialties or did you just kind of stay in your lane? Um, yeah, I, ch I changed a lot. Let's just say that. Um, so I worked at a local firm. And so that local firm, I worked on everything from non for profits, governments, publicly traded companies, private companies, broadcasters, um, and employee benefit plans. I, I kind of hit every every industry there was. And so that was kind of the one of the things that made me look at moving um, because I didn't feel like I was getting any expertise knowledge in it. I was just, you know, kind of paddling along. And so then when I came to Cherry Beckert, uh, they gave me the option of narrowing down my industries to four. And so I worked on manufacturing clients, um, tech clients, life science, and then franchisors. And so with those four, some of them were private and some of them were public, publicly traded. And so from those four, I started working on those for almost two years until I figured out which one I really enjoyed or the two that I really enjoy, which end up being healthcare and life science and then manufacturing clients. And then from there, I took my career up um, and started just specializing in those. What are some of the challenges that you've had in your career? I know like you've already kind of mentioned some regrets that you've had or things like that you could do differently, um, but what are some of the challenges you've had? So many challenges, <laughs> needless to say. Um, challenges, one of them was work-life balance. And I know people talk about work-life balance, but work-life balance for everyone is different. And it took me a long time to understand that that was true. So what I had to do to make my work-life balance is those networking events that I wanted to go to to grow the business, I needed to make those become my friends. I needed to find friends with there. So I was also getting an outlet for a life piece of it. And so that was one of the challenges because I used to think that work-life balance was me being done at the day at 5 or 6 p.m. But that's not what work-life balance is. It's some days I go in at 9 a.m. It's some days I go in at 5 a.m. So I can go do something in the evening or sometimes I leave in the afternoon. And it's, so it's creating that schedule that works best for you and adapting to it and not feeling guilty for, you know, it's not what you always thought it was going to be, um, which I thought it took me, I don't know, probably four years to figure that out. Another thing was finding the right mentor, which I think I talked to you guys just about a little bit ago, but you know, it's finding the right person you connect with um, is very key. Um, and I didn't, uh, for the first four years of my career, I didn't have the right mentor. Uh, we wanted different things and I could not relate. The next thing is like learning leadership, right? 
we all think we're leaders. We all think, um, you know, in the team environments that you guys have in the group environments, you know, there's always someone or a couple of people who step up and take that leadership role. Well, that leadership role versus a leadership role of managing 30 people is a lot different uh, because there's a lot more, there's different personalities in there. And figuring out the communication style that works for all 30 people, it takes time and understanding and how you're gonna communicate those things um, to those individuals. And so it took me a while to understand that I can't just do a mass communication through email or through a Zoom call. I had to go into the groups and figure out who, um, I don't know if you guys know Enneagram or anything, but who's my sevens? Uh, on my Enneagram or who's my eights on Enneagram and kind of start grouping those into buckets and making sure I'm changing my style communication that fits best for them versus making them all understand my communication style and being like, oh, you didn't understand what I wanted you to do. Uh, so I thought that was one of the largest challenges I had and it continuously is a challenge um, and then making sure as a partner, the challenge I have now is every decision I have affects multiple people and has a ripple effect. So trying to understand what my decision now, how to affect that person or those people, plus the other thousand people that it'll affect that I never even would have thought of that it would affect them. So that's the challenge I'm still working through, needless to say. So if you guys have any tips and tricks. <laughs> um, you, I think you touched on it a second ago. Uh, you were talking about like finding your uh, specialty, your niche within an audit or whatever accounting you're doing. And um, I know I want to do audit, but it is very hard to find what you want to specialize in, especially when you haven't done most of it. How would you recommend finding what you uh, really want to specialize in? Spend the first two years of your career doing everything and then start making a list of what you liked about it and what you didn't like about it. Like governments are not for me I or employee benefit plans. Employee benefit plans, my, after my internship, I could tell you employee benefit plans were not for me. So I, I like made a list of why I didn't think those worked for me, what was wrong with them that it didn't connect with me. <clears throat> and then I kept redefining it as I, I went through. So my best client base is um, clients who have pretty good knowledge of accounting, but also um, like help and who wanna reach out ahead of time before they enter into large transactions. I don't like surprises. I don't like to go in for an audit in February and they tell me that they did three acquisitions and I have to account for all of that in a very short period of time. So it's just finding what fits best for you. And usually within that type of client that you're looking for, they are in a certain client base or an industry. So your non for profits those are usually the nicest people you'll ever work with, but they don't usually have all of the knowledge bases a publicly traded company does because they don't need to. So it's just finding what you want. But yeah, for the first two years, try everything. Schooling wise, what do you recommend, you know, should someone just stop at their bachelor's or should they, if they want to advance further in the accounting field, should they go ahead and do their master's and their PhD? So I only have a bachelor's. I got my bachelor's in 150 hours in four years um, because I didn't want to pay tuition for grad school. But if I was going to go to be a, a controller or into a corporate world, I think getting your master's is a good idea. Um, your PhD, you'll definitely have to ask Amanda about that. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, I have a question. What would you recommend someone like you moved, you know, away after working at a smaller firm? How did you adjust to a going to like a bigger firm and b being away from like home? Like, I guess you could say, I don't know if you like, was that hard 
Cause like, I don't know if I would like to move somewhere. It's always in the back of my mind. I'm like, how would I adjust to a whole new place, a whole new career and everything hit you at once? I will be honest with you. The first nine months of moving, it was not fun. Um, so I had my college friends, right. That still lived. I worked in Charleston. So I had my college friends that lived in Huntington um, in Charleston. So I had those connections. And then my first public accounting experience, I had 10 amazing friends out of there and I'm still friends with them to this day. And so I felt like I was just leaving them and, you know, it was, it was very upsetting, but truly it was, it was right for me and like what I wanted to pursue and what I needed to pursue. Um, so the first nine months making friends in another area is hard because you don't have college to connect you. And I did not understand that. So I started networking with people. So essentially creating that experience so I could meet and greet people. I did intramural sports. I played a lot of kickball and a lot of volleyball. And then anyway, within a year I had my friend group and it's been incredible. Like I feel like I have a new family down here and it's very supportive and my friends from West Virginia, they come down several times a year. I have a large Halloween party every year where everyone comes down and we kind of do reunions or some of my college friends and I, we travel um, internationally every year. We do Australia and New Zealand one year and Finland, things like that. So we just kind of connect through that. And then coming to a larger firm, um, I've been one of those people who don't get nervous but should get nervous. Um, and so I, I wasn't nervous. <laughs> I just kind of walked in and said, I'm just going to, you know, be here, work, and it's going to work out great. Um, and it did. It did. But making those new connections in an office, you have to prove yourself again. So if you've worked for a firm and you've worked for them for several years, you've already proven yourself. So going to another firm or corporation or anything, you have to then prove yourself again. You're like, Darn, I put all that effort in to proving myself three years ago. I don't want to do that again. But you do. You put all that effort in. You prove yourself. And, and then you look back and you're like, well, that was easy. Did yeah, that's your question. Yeah. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. Yeah. Did you? I'm sure it helped your move that you're around some gorgeous beaches in that area. It is, or the mountains, you know, Raleigh is two hours from the beach and two and a half hours from the mountains. So it's not a hard road to hold. And then all the colleges here, like NC State, Duke, UNC, it's just really great connections. And you still feel like you have that college experience where you can meet and greet people. And there's a lot of young professionals and this area is continuing to grow. I mean, five years ago when I moved down here, um, I bought a house. I was really going to stick it out. I was making sure that I was going to make it a permanent home. So I bought a house and within three years, the business district grew up around me and I, I actually just sold it last year and I don't even recognize the place that I bought at that point in time. I spent five years in the Jacksonville area, so Oh, I love that. I'm actually, I'm headed down to Fort Lauderdale in April. Uh, I have a client down there, but I also have friends. So she used to live in Jacksonville. Or are you talking about Jacksonville, North Carolina? Or Jacksonville, North Carolina, down Atlantic okay. Beach, Emerald Isle. Yeah, Wilmington. Yes. Wilmington, what is it? Greenville. Wrightsville's right there too. Oh, that's a great area. Yeah. Were you in the military? My husband was, that's, he actually re retired out of Jacksonville, North Carolina, so. See, you should just come on back. No. <laughs> Too many hurricanes. But yeah. Anybody have anything else I can help you with? How do you think COVID is changing the accounting profession and, and the way things are doing with respect to work? Drastically. So <laughs> big four, um, they still went into the offices before COVID every day. And so needless to say, they've drastically had to change that piece of it. 
Um, and it depends on each firm, right? So I have some friends that are still in local and they're going into the office. I go into the office once a week when I have like 100 pages of financial statements to review and I just can't look at a screen anymore. But the rest of the time I can do everything at my house. Um, and so it's actually making people get out of we're accountants, right? We like to do the same thing over and over again. We want some consistency. Well, at least most of us. Um, and so it's actually pushing us outside of our edge and where we're used to being. And so I know we've created a little group that is trying to decide where we're going to go. And so what we're probably going to end up with is a hybrid model. And so it'd be like you'd be in office two to three days so that you're still networking and meeting your fellow um, seniors, your fellow staff people, and to help with that culture aspect of it. Um, the downside has been the culture aspect of it. It's been very hard for new hires or interns to come in and understand who Cherry Beckard is, who Dixon Hughes is, et cetera, and get to, under, to meet people and create and understand that culture and that feel of who we are. And so we wanna make sure that we're still creating that but also allowing people to have a more flexible work. So what we're probably looking at is two to three days in office and then two to three days at home. Do you think that you guys will continue that schedule uh, even if COVID restrictions are lifted? So right now with COVID, everyone's at home. Uh, you just come in if you need to, but most people work from home. There's about seven people in our office that works from here. And that's because they either have like four roommates and can't concentrate or they have different things, you know. Um, but yes, once COVID um, and vaccines and all that starts happening, we're gonna work on that hybrid model, bringing people back in. Um, because our new hires are actually one of the, so we had five new hires in August no, six, and four of them have worked from in office like four days a week, just so that they can have um, kind of that culture feel, but also so they can have more of a training feel, um, because unfortunately, um, training through a virtual model is a little bit tougher on the new hire, because you guys, as a new hire, you have to be very upfront and letting people know you don't understand something, or um, we do team rooms, where we open those up two hours a day to let people, you know, just ask whatever questions you have. But truly, we're always there available, but you have to be the first person to initiate it. And that's kind of scary, right? Like to call a partner and be like, I have a question. But if we're in the office, you could just walk by my door and walk in and be like, hey, I have a question. Can you help me? And I'd be like, of course. And I'd help you anytime. But it's just a little bit different because you can't see that person and read their face and see how their day is going. I feel bad because I'm asking so many questions, but I have to ask about the uh, tax bot that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, so did like you guys run into problems with that? Did you have to uh, like redo some of the tax returns or was it uh, you kind of just put the information in and then everything else was smooth sailing? No, so we tested it the year before, um, and so we tested it on fake clients at that point in time, and by the time that it did real clients, it did 100 of them accurately, and yeah, but they're just informational now. They're not crazy like tax returns, but they're just informational, but anyway, so that's what our innovation group is always looking at um, <coughs> to look into and in different ways to expand and we're like currently looking at different softwares. We're always trying different softwares, which is one of my favorite things about being in the Raleigh office. Our head of innovation sits here, our CEO sits here, and our head of audit sits here. So our head of innovation sits here and he'll just, you know, he used to go around, he'd be like, do you wanna try a new software? Do you wanna try this? Um, and I always like trying different things because I'm like, what gets me there the most efficient and quickest way possible. And so um, we did a lot of data analytics. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of MindBridge, um, but that's something that we've probably four or five years been working through and we continue to grow out that practice piece of it or Smartsheet. Uh, 
Our head of innovation ended up speaking at the Smartsheet conference before they did their IPO because we were one of the first people that, to roll that out with them. Um, trying to think some other things that we've worked through. Anyway, if it's new, we're there trying it. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so you mentioned that you went ahead and within your four year degree, got your 150 hours. For those students that really want to do that, um, what are the additional classes that you feel add most value to get to the 150? Again, I probably didn't do this the best way. <laughs> But in the summer, I took um, I took my science classes that you have to take, um, or I would take theater class or an art class. But for like my accounting and IT classes, I always made sure I took those during the semesters uh, to make sure that I was spending all my quality time on those. But then the summer, they're compressed down to like four weeks. I would pick up the not so important classes and do those during that period of time. And then I also did an internship with the housing authority. I think it's Huntington Housing Authority. I did an internship with them to get credit. I think I ended up getting like six hours with them. And then I also worked for Hester and Campbell um, to try out tax uh, back in the day. And I think I got some credit hours for that too. So making sure like, your internships also equal um, some credit hours. And then I think I end up having to do like 18 hours a couple of semesters. I think I almost end up, I end up with a double major in accounting, finance, and almost criminal justice. Why criminal justice? I, I'm not sure, but the classes seemed easier. Not I'm not hating on any criminal justice majors, but they just seemed something I could fill in with my schedule. It was a little different. Are you guys getting your masters? Are you guys looking? I've thought about it because I'm already sitting at, um, after last semester, I think I did 15 last semester. I'm sitting at almost, I think, 100, in between 140 and 150 hours already. Oh, wow. So. I'm, I'm a perpetual student, I guess. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that ever. Well, I, I'm older. So I started back in the nineties doing college, ended up getting married and having kids and did the stay at home mom thing. And um, now that all my kids are older and basically out of the house, it's time to go back. So they took all those credits that I already done and so I'm just adding more and more and I'm liking school. So just want to keep adding. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, a PhD, I think you would ask about that. I mean, at some point in time, I thought about that because Amanda made being a professor look amazing, but I just didn't end up going down that path. Um, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Unless Amanda tells me differently. I don't think my husband will wait around for me to do a PhD though. <laughs> he wants to retire a second time. He wants me to hurry up and finish. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you guys for having me. Well, thanks for coming. Glad you got to join us and know things were crazy with the whole COVID stuff. Yeah, and I'll put my information here in the message. So again, if you guys have any questions, um, I talk to Casey once in a while. She's down here now. But like, if you guys have any questions, please reach out. Like, I always want to help my Marshall alumni. You know, if you don't come work for Cherry Beckard, I still want to make sure I'm helping you guys out with anything that you need. That sounds good. And I'm assuming uh, they can also connect with you on LinkedIn. Yes, please. It's always great to catch up and see how you're doing. I know, I mean, 
thinking about it 11 years ago doing beta off the side, <laughs> I did not think I would be here. <laughs> yeah. We got to know each other pretty well on a drive to um, DC, that's for sure. So my middle name is Kate and Amanda named her daughter's middle name Kate. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. She's Emily. Kate. I say that I created that. I, I made that happen, but let's be honest, I didn't. But that's yeah, my Yeah, there claim were a to couple fame. of different names we were kicking <laughs> around, and I think you you definitely were voting for the Kate. Imagine that be pushing someone to vote for something. <laughs> that was a fun trip though. We, you know, hosted the regional meeting in DC and that was that was pretty neat, pretty special. It really was. And you guys were talking about Vida, my friend a friend named Jessica, imagine that. Um, she used to work, she went with us on the trip and she did Vida and now she just does tax returns on the side. And the only experience she had was with Vida and she's gained a lot of knowledge from that. So it's very worthwhile. Well, I think Amanda helped her a lot through Vida because she ran Vida, but needless to say. It's been an interesting year trying to get up, get that off the ground. It, just so many little details, getting access to the software. Um, we got everybody trained and now we're kind of on hold waiting for United Way to help us with that process. So it's been interesting. Well, I can't imagine. Well, hopefully you guys get it kicked off soon. That's the goal. We uh, thought we were going to make uh, progress last week and we did get to see the software that we're going to be use, using to do most of it. But we found out that the old volunteers, uh, she had trouble creating, e creating access because uh, the access had already been used through our, our Marshall link. So she's got to recreate all of that within her computer <laughs> system. So those are the things you don't plan on that uh, you have to figure out as you go. No, you do not. <laughs> but that's what makes life fun though. That's right. For sure. Well, it's tax. It's got to be complicated. It can't be straightforward. I mean, let's just be honest here. There are a lot of layers. <laughs> yes. And sometimes you just have to think about things for many, many minutes. <laughs> That's a great tip that you picked up from tax class. I know. <laughs> good. Well, I hope you guys have a good evening. And again, if you need anything, just let me know. Sounds good. We'll stay in touch. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.